So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone. As uh, Shai said, um, I'm a product manager in CloudGuard, and tonight I'm going to be talking to you about three really cool new features that we're uh, coming up with in uh, 2022. Uh, features that are already available in early availability that are already being used by customers of uh, various sizes um, that you can request already today to enable in your uh, CloudGuard account if that's something uh, you want to do. Um, and will be, as uh, Shai just said, officially launched early in November. Um, so you'll uh, you know, keep, a, keep an eye for, uh, for our publications around this and, uh, and, and announcements. Uh, so what we're going to do tonight is um, a deep dive into those features. First, I'll go over three very quick uh, slides to explain the idea behind each of those features, why we're doing this, uh, what we're doing. And then we'll just you know, open the portal and I'll show you uh, what's going on, what are the, the features, and um, you can ask questions. Um, so first of all, let's talk about um, what we call AWP for agentless workload posture. Um, so as you get from the name, the idea here is to uh, be able to look into workloads, but in agentless way. Um, so instead of having to go through any kind of complex deployment, having to install agents on the virtual machines um, to be able to get details into what's going on in those machines, uh, we are able to do this uh, on site uh, through scanning snapshots um, of, the, of the instance volume. Um, so with this solution, we can achieve very deep visibility into many things. Um, so I here only mentioned vulnerabilities, uh, malware, exposed credentials, but there are a lot of things we can do with this, uh, with this great uh, capability. So we'll be expanding uh, the, the scope of what we provide with AWP. Um, but it is important to understand that now CloudGuard provides as part of the offering without having to request any ad additional licensing. Um, it, it's really completely included within the, the Cloud Suite. You have now the ability to, uh, to scan your virtual machines to understand uh, if you have vulnerabilities there. Uh, and I'll show you later on how it fits into the rest of the, um, of the system. Um, so that's for AWP. So Benny, right after that, we'll show you how to do the onboarding to the feature and, uh, and, and what, how the results look like in the portal. The second feature uh, that I want to talk about, and on this I'll, I'll expand a little bit more, is what we call effective risk management. So the idea here is pretty simple. We've talked with our customers. We talk with customers on a daily basis. Um, we understand that the main pain point today for customers is, uh, is a pain point for us as well, is uh, time, resources, right? Um, so when a customer is dealing with huge amounts of resources, it means generally a lot of alerts going on in a, in a security tool as well, um, in, in our tool as well as other tools in, 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 in any case. Um, we have all those great features that add value, but in the end, customers do not necessarily know what to start with, what to uh, attend to first. What are the assets that require immediate attention? What are the, the findings? What are the alerts that need to be fixed right away? Um, so I, the idea of effective risk management is to help customers manage effectively their risk, uh, manage effectively their time, so that if they have only five minutes to spend on CloudGuard and on their security posture, they, they, they spend those five minutes in the best way possible. So we do that uh, using a lot of context information um, and machine learning, uh, and we provide asset risk scoring. So you'll see uh, in a few minutes in the portal how this looks. Uh, we're able to, ca to calculate the risk score for your cloud assets, and this way you can understand what are the assets that are the most at risk. And again, I'll stress it when I do the demo, but this risk is not just a simple um, result of you know, alerts uh, open on, on, on the, the asset, but really uh, taking into account all the context, maybe network topology, maybe uh, IAM permissions, everything that, that the CloudGuard portal provides, um, the CloudGuard platform, sorry, uh, we, we feed into the risk to be able to give you this accurate um, indication of, of the, the security status of the asset. Um, part of the, the ERM is also reducing in general your attack surface, understanding attack vectors, um, which ways 
can uh, can an attacker potentially get into your your cloud environments um, so that you really again focus on on the right uh, on the right things uh, and obviously the last stage of the effective risk management is to provide um, remediation that is straightforward that is actionable um, and we, we call this minimal effective dose again you'll see the effective word uh, come and come and come back uh, our goal is to make your work uh, as effect effective, as efficient as possible. Um, so when we talk about remediation, this is uh, an obvious um, uh, requirement as well. Giving you those little actions, those those you know five top actions you need to do to make sure you have the highest impact in your uh, in your um, risk posture and your your security risk. And finally, the last feature that we'll be discussing tonight is called Cloud Infrastructure Entitlement Management. So I didn't come up uh, with the, the name. It's a term that was uh, invented by Gartner uh, about in, in 2020. Um, so the idea here is, again, uh, to, to reduce your attack surface uh, from a specific angle, the angle of uh, IAM permission. So what happens today uh, for all our customers is, really all i don't think there's a one uh, one customer that can say they, they don't have this this kind of issue is that most of the time assets cloud assets are being granted permissions that they do not need and this is done because you know lack of knowledge lack of time uh lack of resources to really dive into what's needed and what's not so you end up with resources with assets that have permissions that you do not expect them to have and if an asset like that is compromised, then suddenly you have an attacker that also has permissions uh, you never intended them to have. And sometimes those permissions are very serious, very sensitive. Um, so Kim comes uh, into the picture to, first of all, provide you with visibility, understand what are those permissions you're granting, because uh, if you guys are already familiar with, uh, if we take the example of AWS, uh, the different levels, the different types of policies that you can um, use to grant permissions to an entity. If it if it is um, service control policies on the organization, if it is permission boundaries, if it is uh, an inline policy, you have several ways of defining permissions. They all work differently, and you know it, it's not so simple to understand when you look at a cloud asset in the console of the the cloud provider. To understand what are those permissions that that are granted, um, so this is the first uh, leg of of Keem, providing visibility into all the permissions granted, and even more than that, making sense of all those permissions to provide what we call effective policy. Um, so, what are the permissions that are actually granted when you do you know the math? Um, because a policy could grant something that another one denies. So we do this work for you. So, cloud assets um, permissions make uh, make sense uh, easily on, on, on the cloud world uh, platform. Um, and level two of Keem is permission optimization. So now, uh, for those of you that are already familiar with CloudGuard, uh, and for the others, I'll explain quickly, but um, part of CloudGuard is what we call intelligence. Intelligence is um, kind of our uh, runtime piece. We're bringing in uh, logs from cloud providers, activity logs and network traffic logs, Network traffic is irrelevant to this uh, session, so I won't comment it, but we're um, bringing from the cloud provider the logs of everything that's happening within the cloud environment, uh, any API call, any login to the console, any action that's done from the console, from the CLI, whatever, we're bringing all of this in. Uh, we're making sense of those logs by enriching them, um, which means basically adding all the information we have from our inventory piece. Um, and we are able to, you know, take those logs to understand what are the permissions that are actually in use. So now we have a cloud asset. We know what are the effective permissions that, that it has. We know what are the, the permissions it, it is actually using through intelligence. We can do the correlation and deduce what are the permissions that are aggressive and should be removed. Um, so when this is the case, we again here provide you with actionable remediation policies you can take copy and paste into your, your cloud vendor, uh, but other type of remediation as well to, um, to ensure you are compliant with what we call list privilege. So again, only granting the smallest set of permissions necessary to perform a task. 
Um, so with all that said, uh, we're ready to move on to the demo. Shai, I don't know if you've been monitoring questions, if there is something we should answer before uh, moving no, on to the demo. No questions. No? Okay, great. So Benny, you want to take the screen? Yeah, thank you, Avi. Sure. Um, Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, so uh, uh, my name is uh, Benny Zemur. I am uh, the team leader uh, of uh, AWP. So in AWP, we are uh, scanning a VM a machine. Currently, we start... Benny, we don't see it in the presentation mode. We see the slides oh. like... Okay. Now it's good. Okay. So uh, yeah, so in, in the agentless, we are uh, scanning uh, the VM machine. Uh, we start with uh, uh, AWS uh, EC2 machine, and uh, we are uh, starting working also on Azure. Uh, currently, we are uh, scanning for uh, uh, vulnerabilities uh, packages uh, with all the package managers uh, and OS. Currently, only in Linux. We have some uh, limitation. We are still uh, under. Uh, uh, EA, so we are uh, uh, we are not a uh, GA uh, uh, yet, and uh, so what I want to show you today, so uh, just to understand how uh, uh, what we are giving. So we have uh, we have in AWP we have a, an engine to scan uh, all the VMs. The VM is all uh, the scanning is, is uh, agentless, so we are not affecting the machine itself. We are uh, using snapshots. Uh, we will see that, and uh, all we are doing is uh, uh, running on the snapshot, and we can scan and get all the information. We can get, uh, as I said, uh, vulnerabilities. We can go to get also uh, uh, secrets, and all, also it's open for all the features that we can uh, uh, develop in the future. Uh, everything that we, we can think about that is related to the disk itself, we can uh, do that. So. Just to understand the, the setup, and currently we have we have two we have a two model of the scanning. So I, I will uh, focus on the SaaS model. Uh, this is what is working now, and you can uh, and we have already customers that is using it. Uh, and so the SaaS model says that we are scanning all the scan is in our uh, side. So if in the left side we can see an account of, of customer with uh, some uh, VMs, each VM of some volumes uh, with data. And we, we want to uh, enable this feature. So what you need to do is uh, the first thing is to uh, onboard. In order to onboard, you need to uh, install a cloud formation template uh, on his uh, account, and it gave a uh, permission to our uh, cloud guard uh, backend in order to do the scan. Once we have this permission, AWP can uh, see and interact with the account and can uh, start uh, scanning. So the scan we'll start with creating a snapshot of each volume of each machine. And then uh, when we have the volume, we can uh, share it with, with our backend and we scan it in, our, in a VM that you run, run inside our uh, backend. And the result will be uh, populated to the uh, uh, backend and to the, to, to the UI and you can see that. Um, so this is the, the model that uh, the data is scanned in the customer account. In, a, in a, our account. There is also another model that will be uh, ready at the, the end of this uh, this month. Uh, uh, and the model, it's for a customer, and this, we see a lot of some customers that want to scan uh, all, everything inside their accounts in the customer account itself. So this, the difference is that the scanner itself will be run inside the customer account. Uh, so what I want to show now is it's a, it's a onboarding. So let's see, uh, uh, so I will show, let me see. Do you see the, the UI uh, screen? Yes. Okay, the so portal. the portal, yeah. Okay, so in the portal, uh, there is uh, the list of the environments that we are uh, already protected. So every uh, customer that have already uh, connected is the AWS account. Uh, once we are enabling uh, the feature, uh, you get a new column of AWP. So what you need to do is just to click on Enable AWP. 
and uh, and to choose. Uh, so as I said, currently we are only in the SaaS mode. In the future, we can be also uh, choose here in the, if you want a, a in account. But currently, I focus on a, a SaaS mode. Then just to uh, press on the create cross account tool. This will link us to a cloud formation a console in the AWS console. And you get this quick link to create a stack in AWS. So we have the information. If you want to see exactly what uh, you are installing, so you can take this uh, template and see it's public. You can see the resources that, that we are creating in the account. Um, so it's uh, currently some permission and the lambdas that uh, handle uh, uh, the, the snap have the permission to do the snapshot, uh, etc. And uh, you just need to to uh, approve as a process and to click on create stack. It can take about uh, two or three minutes in, in order to install all the resources the resources here. And uh, once it will be ready, you just need to uh, to go back to the UI. To the, to the console and click here on the next button. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to wait all this time. I, I will just jump to a, a, to look like how, a, how it will look like as a result of a scan of that. So uh, you can uh, drill down from protected asset, uh, from the risk management or from a protected asset in asset to, sh to look inside, uh, for example, uh, to, you can uh, uh, filter by uh, EC2 instances to select, and you can see each uh, machine uh, that you want. So, for example, this one has a lot of uh, uh, risks. So, I, I can go to the vulnerability tab. And here in the vulnerability tab, this is a result of the scanning of AWP. You can see here it's a list of CVEs that we found, so uh, sorted by packages. So each uh, item here in the left is a package that we we found, and for each package you can see uh, how much uh, fixable a CV uh, you can fix uh, if you uh, follow up the remediation. So for example, this package have um, uh, all of this uh, kind of CVE. You can see a description for each CVE. And you can see here the remediation that you need to upgrade from the current version that is a 2.00 to upgrade to a version 9.01. And you will fix all of that uh, CVE, et cetera. You can uh, drill down each uh, package here to see exactly uh, where is the location on the disk, uh, where is it where is it installing, which package manager. So it can be Python, it can be a, a node, a, uh, and Java, etc. cetera. Uh, there is also a tab here of remediation summary. So this is also some the remediations that uh, are uh, regrouping together. So you can see for each package, uh, what is the current uh, version and what, the, what is the version that you need to uh, upgrade. Um, as I said, cur currently uh, future, uh, features that we will uh, 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 Develop will be the to fill the secret. Currently, it's empty and threat also uh, empty. So, but something that is coming uh, soon, uh, the secret is uh, something that will come soon. Uh, and uh, this is it. This is how you, you can see the uh, result. Uh, what is important to know that uh, we are scanning only Linux machine. We are scanning uh, only running machines. So machines that uh, VMs that are uh, in uh, uh, that are stopped, not running. We will not, uh, we will skip them. Um, we are sky so and also uh, there is some uh, uh, limitation on uh, size of the of the uh, uh, disk. So we are scanning uh, for, uh, up to uh, one terabyte. Um, this is the main uh, uh, limitation, and uh, the scan will be every 24 hours. So each machine, each VM, we will we will scan again each uh, 24 hour, and uh, the result will appear uh, in the UI, and you will get uh, it sorted by uh, the uh, the scores that uh, ERM uh, will show you. Any question? Shall we? 
Yeah, so we have a few questions on the Q&A. So only Linux VM are supported, right? So yes, this is what you said, that only Linux. Is there a plan in the future to scan other, other type of machines, by the way? Yes, also we are planning to add uh, Windows, of course. Uh, and AWP covers only AWS for now? Yeah, and uh, we are working on Azure. Uh, it's it should be in a quote uh, in quarter one, uh, a first version in quarter one of uh, next year. And Andre asked also what the additional resources are created by the safety. Yeah, good question. So currently uh, we are uh, uh, creating. So it it depends, by the way, if you are running in uh, the uh, SaaS mode or in the in account mode. So uh, in the SaaS mode. Uh, we are in, in both we are creating a, a cross account role that give permission to a cloud formation to cloud guard to uh, access the account uh, for uh, uh, the needed permission and also we are creating a lambda that this only this lambda will uh, have if the code is uh, public you can see the code and it's uh, with very strict permission and this lambda will uh, uh, create the snapshot of the permission to create the snapshot and uh, delete the snapshot etc so you can see everything that we are doing we are not doing that by the cross account role and um, in the SAS mode there is a problem of uh, uh, when encrypted for encrypted volume so because we not we, we cannot share the, the uh, and we don't want to share the original key uh, that encrypt uh, the volumes so we are uh, of, of part of the uh, um, onboarding uh, in the CFT. There is a, a key that we are creating in order to uh, uh, decrypt and re-encrypt with this key, and only with this key we are sharing the data. And uh, and this is uh, for uh, for that we are using this key. Uh, in uh, in the mode in the neck mode that we will release uh, soon, the we don't need that because all the scan will be in the same account. So if you are in the same account, you have permission to the keys that in the account, and uh, you know and we are not creating this uh, key. Benny, is there an option to start the scanning manually? Currently, no. It's something that we are uh, thinking about with some limitation. We don't also to don't want also to uh, abuse of that. Uh, but it's something that uh, uh, we are thinking about. Of course, if the if there is some uh, change that in the configuration of the number of volumes, etc. Also, for example, a machine is a start or a stop and a restart, etc. So for each change of like that, we will rescan it as soon as possible and we will not wait again 24 hours. And also a new machine that is added will be soon as soon as possible in the next hour maximum. Thank you, Benny. And Abby, this is for you. Can you tell how does it being licensed? Uh, for now, it's part of the, the Cloud Guard licensing. There's nothing additional. So for uh, for customers that have uh, already Cloud Guard, the uh, CSPM can request to can... enable it, and they start. They can start. And how it. do how do they request to enable it? Um, so well, what yes. what is the process? There there is no. I mean, if they have a checkpoint, uh, if they work with an SE or with an account manager, then I would go directly to the to that person. If not, uh, you can reach out to me. You can uh, open even the. Uh, um, something on the forum in Checkmates. I mean, there are many ways to to get in touch. So, okay, so you can uh, paste your email at the end or give your email. Can, or, uh, yeah, I can definitely do that. Uh, Benny, is there a plan to, or also Abby, is there a plan to support GCP? Uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's not on the soon uh, uh, development, but yes, there is a request for that. So there are uh, other uh, questions, but uh, let's start because we need to cover uh, more topic and let's see at the end if we can answer uh, uh, more questions. And by the way, if we will not uh, be able to answer all of the questions uh, live, we will take them and Abby, you will uh, be able to answer and we'll put it on the checkmate uh, post with the recording. So uh, uh, Abby, let's uh, let's move forward. Thank you. Um, so can you, screen, can you see the risk management dashboard? We see, yes. Okay, great. Um, so now we're going to take a look at the, the effective risk management. So in, in the portal, it's called risk management. There is a new um, menu item. Um, you can see it's in preview. So same thing as AWP, you can already request uh, to, to have it enabled. Um, so the very first screen I want to show you is the risk dashboard. So the risk dashboard is um, 
the, the idea is really, again, to focus uh, on the things that are the most critical. Um, so we're presenting information about assets that are in, in high risk. Um, our risk score is between zero to 10. So you have assets that are in risk uh, higher than seven here. Um, so we can look at all over all the assets that are in, in risk, in high risk. Um, we have a focus on public assets. So very often uh, when we speak with customers, the very first assets they want to make sure are uh, healthy or uh, uh, well configured uh, are the assets that are publicly exposed. Uh, so this is one of the reasons that uh, we present this here. Uh, I'll get back to this uh, in, in a few minutes. Uh, other examples, the sets are, that have severely exposed credentials, severe CVEs. So anyway, this, this dashboard is your uh, starting point uh, when working with the risk management. Um, it can be filtered. Um, so you can use uh, the filters that are presented in here. Um, and uh, that's pretty much what, okay. Yeah, of course, I prepared the screens before, so I'm not logged out. Um, <laughs> go back in. Okay. Sorry about that. Internet of the house apparently acting out. Okay. Great. And we're back. Um, so again, the risk dashboard is is your uh, you know. Your, uh, your starting screen. Um, and as the feature uh, grows, it will be enriched. There will be uh, other options in here, uh, other widgets, customization options, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you can obviously click on any of those uh, widgets to drill down. Uh, the second screen I want to show you is what we call protected assets um, in, in the risk management. So you can see here a list of all the assets um, that are uh, supported in effective risk management um ordered by the risk so we can see riskiest assets on the top and what i want to explain a bit now is how we calculate a risk score because I think this is a an, an important uh, piece of information um so if we look in here at the the columns we can see some of the we can we can understand a little bit what's what's going into this uh, this risk score um so we have a base for the risk we we start calculating the risk score with uh, two main items, misconfigurations and vulnerabilities. Um, so misconfigurations are um, a result of our CSPM engine, our compliance engine. Um, though uh, we're not using any kind of misconfiguration as um, a, an, an input to the risk score because some misconfigurations are purely compliance related. So what we did is we created uh, rule sets that are completely dedicated to uh, risk management um, and that know to identify only those misconfigurations that present a security risk. Um, so very soon, um, customers will be able to connect their own rule set to the risk score calculation. We, this is a feedback that we got during our early availability phase that um, some customers, even though they understand that we have the knowledge of um, what are the things that they should be looking at, they don't always have the capability, the bandwidth to, to, to handle all those, all those things. They have worked on customizing rule sets to their needs and to their uh, bonds. So, um, so this is one, one thing that's coming up very soon, this ability to, to connect uh, your own rule set to, to the risk score. Uh, the second part of the, the base risk is vulnerabilities. Uh, so the vulnerabilities, uh, not just CVEs, but also threats and secrets, as Benny explained, um, as a result of the, the AWP feature, but not only. Uh, we already provide an integration with AWS Inspector uh, V2 as well. So we can get CVs from, uh, from AWS Inspector. Threat and Secrets is a feature only of our own uh, AWP uh, uh, scanner. Um, so going forward, uh, we'll definitely uh, plan integration with other vulnerability scanners so that uh, we can work with whatever the customer is already using. Um, but this is uh, the current situation. So once we have this base risk, again, misconfigurations and vulnerabilities, we modify it. So we have two main modifiers, uh, one that we call context uh, and the second that we call impact. So context is basically the probability of an asset being attacked, right? So 
um, it's not just um, not every asset is exposed in the same way. So typically, uh, the network exposure of an asset, if an asset is public, is partially public, it's private, this is going to influence the, the risk score of the asset. Um, if the asset is running, this is also a context uh, information. So again, as time goes by, we're going to add to this uh, more and more. But it's important to understand that from the start, the risk score that we're attributing to assets is modified by context information. Um, and the second part, so the impact, is about what happens if that asset is compromised, right? If there is an issue with that asset, what is the impact on my cloud environment? Um, so here as well, we have a lot of plans around uh, things that, uh, that we can add. But as of today, we're already factoring in uh, what we call the business priority. Business priority is a way for customers to define their important assets. Uh, it's not a must. It's an optional um, feature. But uh, it allows you to tell us, for example, that some assets are part of a dev environment and therefore less important than assets in production. It allows customers to tell us that assets that are part of the payment application are more critical than assets part of the HR system. So, so this is um, a great feature um, because, again, it allows the risk to become much more accurate. Um, and that uh, I'll show you in a, in a few minutes how we can define the business priority. Uh, the last thing I wanted to explain is that uh, on side of the impact, uh, another uh, value that is not shown right now, but uh, is going to be part of the risk in a very, very short amount of time, uh, is what we call the IM sensitivity. Um, so we're going to talk about IM permission in a, in a little bit when we when we explain uh, the Kim feature. But um, because we're able to analyze those IM permissions, we're also able to tell when an asset has permissions that are very sensitive or less sensitive. So we, we calculate the score, and I'll show it to you uh, very soon. But th this score is also part of the impact of the, the risk score. So um, if this asset is compromised, because of its permissions, it can do a lot of damage or, a lot, or, or very few damage to the cloud environment. So the risk score will be adjusted accordingly. Um, so now, if we uh, open, um, for example, the here I have an EC2 instance that is the riskiest asset in my uh, environment, I can see uh, the overview screen. So this overview screen is also uh, another screen that is uh, being worked on as we speak uh, that will be available for all assets. And, and the idea here is to uh, provide this uh, 360 view of everything that the system knows uh, about the assets. So it's a work in progress, but um, um, but this is a direction we're taking. So we can see here the risk score. And when I hover uh, over the risk, I can see why the risk is what it is. Uh, we see we have critical severity vulnerabilities. We have uh, an asset that is of high importance. It's uh, public. Um, so this is why the risk score is what it is. Um, in this one, I don't have any misconfiguration. So maybe let's go back. Let's see if I have something um, different to show you or not. And then I'll move on to the business priority to show you a bit how it's defined. Yeah, so we have here, as you can see, we have some uh, S3 buckets with misconfigurations. So yeah, so we can see here what are the top misconfigurations. Um, that should be remediated. Uh, we can see uh, the distribution of critical and high misconfiguration. Uh, I can click on this to be redirected to the findings that are only uh, risk management, as you can see, to address the different things that, uh, that I need to do on this uh, S3 bucket. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to show is the business priority, oh, really. Apologize about this. Always, uh, I mean, live demos are not uh, not real if uh, no issue happens. Okay. Um, so here we can see how uh, business priority rules can be defined. So uh, we're not talking about rules in the sense of uh, GSL rules of uh, you know uh, compliance rules. Uh, really, the the word rules here is a 
simple English word uh, uh, and, and not, not more than that. Uh, so we can create as many rules as we want. Uh, we can give it a name. So if I want to define my uh, crown jewels, I can, uh, I can go ahead and, and define it here. Um, so I have several options. Uh, I can, um, for example, say that all the assets that are part of my production environment are uh, crown jewels. That's, a, that's an option. Um, I can also say that um, the assets that are part of this environment, yes, are crown jewels, but not all of them. So I could be using, for example, uh, assets that have a specific tag. Uh, if they have, for example, an owner, then uh, they are crown jewels. Uh, it could be name, you know, terminology conventions that I have. It can be a combination of all of those. Um, so it's up to me to to decide, and then I can select the business priority that I want to attribute to the um, to those assets. And this way, I define the business priority for a group of assets. It's not about going asset asset and 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 deciding there. It's really about creating groups that have uh, something in common um, and giving them. A business priority. Um, so that's pretty much it for the risk management. Um, do we have questions, uh, Shai? You can uh, you can move forward, and we'll do the questions at the end. Okay. So okay, I'm gonna have to reload things. Um, so the the second uh, feature that I wanted to present tonight is uh, the Kim Cloud Infrastructure Entitlement Management. Um, so if you remember what I explained in the beginning during the slides, um, so the, the very first part of, uh, of, of Kim is about visibility, right? So we, we want to provide the customer with visibility into cloud entitlements. Uh, we want to, to, to facilitate auditing, for example. Um, so if it's, if it is for auditing purpose, if it, if it is just, you know, because you're, uh, Doing an investigation of something that happened, and you want, and and, and this is important information. Um, so we added this tab called permissions. So right now I'm looking at the AWS IAM role. Which one, why it's bugging a little bit? But let's see. Let's go back to this from here. Yeah, it's better. So up. Going to use the same entity. Um, so I have a list here of all the the, the asset types that are um, supported by Kim, and I can see that here I'm within an IAM role, um, and I can see in the, under this tab permission I can see a map. I hope you're seeing it uh, well because the um, the arrows are not uh, very visible on my screen here. Contrast is not great, uh, but there are arrows between those uh, different nodes. Um, so what we see here is an IAM role. It is connected to one identity-based policy. It has one policy attached. It's a policy that is customer managed. Um, we can see that this policy has an IAM sensitivity of 50. Uh, so IAM sensitivity, if you remember what I explained before, it's the, the potential damage that uh, the IAM permissions can do to the, to the cloud environment. So here we're uh, in the middle. Uh, from one to to one hundred, so somewhere in the middle, and we can see that from this policy, um, I, I I I have um, sorry, the, the policy is, is is giving permissions to four categories of services. So we have services of compute, of database management and governance, networking and content delivery. Those are categories that are defined by Amazon, not uh, not uh, our own categories. And I can expand those categories to see that, for example, in here, I, I actually give some permissions on the EC2 service. So if I click here, I can see on the right pane what exactly I can do on EC2. So here I can do the action described on all EC2 resources. Uh, if I'm looking here at the RDS, I can see where it appears in the policy and understand easily what can be done um, in this database. Um, we can potentially see here uh, resources. If resources are uh, explicitly defined in the policy, then we could see them as well. Uh, instead of service, it would say that it's a resource base. Uh, I don't have an example in here. Um, so this is a nice map, but as I said, there's just one policy attached. So I could log into the AWS console. Uh, I could finally, I could find this policy. I could understand pretty easily uh, what it grants. 
Um, where things get a little more uh, interesting is, oops, okay. um, for example, when we move on to, yeah, that's going to give me, I'm going I'm to go back to this and, uh, and search again. Uh, so if, for example, I have uh, a role like this one. So I have a role. And it has now not just one policy, but three. There's an identity-based policy that is AWS managed. I have another one that is customer managed. And another one, but I can see here this little icon here. This policy is actually not attached to this role. It's attached to another role, a role B. Uh, but there is a trust relationship that exists between role A and role B. And because of that trust relationship, role A can actually grant the permissions that role B can grant. So this is called role chaining. And this is something that is very important because CloudGuard is able to find those, uh, those policies, to add them to the, the effective permissions that I'll show you in a minute. Um, and and this, is, this is gonna go over just, just one level of trust. If there is a, really a chain, if there are several roles that can assume other role, all, other roles will uh, also um, present that. So here again, same thing, we can see the services um, that are uh, contained within those policies. Um, but as I said, now things are getting more complex, right? We have three policies. We need to understand how they work. Uh, they're all identity-based, so it's actually still uh, easy, but, but it could be an organization SCP. It could be permission boundary. Um, so we have uh, this little button here called consolidated policy that allows you to actually consolidate the three policies make the calculation of what are the permissions that are effectively granted and present them in a table way. Um, so this is not an actual policy, right? This is an artificial policy that we built so that uh, permissions are more legible. You can understand here per service, what exactly can be done, what is allowed, what is denied. Here we don't have denies, but we could see denies as well. What are the actions and on which resources? Um, so with this, it is now very, very straightforward to understand um, what are the effective permissions of uh, a cloud asset. So now moving on to, uh, to another screen. Um, so I want to show you um, right now on the, the Kim overview. Um, so this is, again, my, my dashboard for Kim. I can, I can see here that I have, for example, some uh, users and roles that are inactive. Uh, this is some sort of a... Uh, again, attack surface that uh, you want to reduce, right? If you have things that are not in use, then they need to be deleted, deactivated. So this is something that you should take, take care of. The overprivileged entities, I'll get back to this in a second. And you can see here some information about uh, Kim findings. Um, so Kim findings, just a word on that. Um, we put in, the, in this page all the findings that are connected to the, the topic of Kim. So if you have, for example, a team member um, that is specifically working with uh, everything that's related to IAM, then this is a great place to start because every finding of the system uh, may it come from intelligence, from compliance, uh, or Kim itself, if it's uh, overprivileged entities, everything is uh, presented in the screen. Uh, everything is... Um, is uh, Yes, concentrated here. Um, and we can see, we can, for example, group here by labels so we can understand the type of uh, issues we're dealing with. Okay, so we have uh, things, for example, for privilege escalation, things that are connected to inactive entities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if I go back to this, I can start from this, I can start from findings. Um, I can see here that I have some severely overprivileged entities. Um, so I have Lambda functions and I have IAM roles. So I'm going to look at the IAM roles and I, I'll say a word on the Lambda functions at the end. Um, so I have 26 um, IAM roles that are high, highly or critically overprivileged. So let, let me take uh, the first one, for example. Um, so just to, uh, to, step, to, to backtrack a little, uh, if you remember what I explained in the beginning, uh, we have on one hand the effective permissions. We saw it in the map, right? We we know what is the the effective policy of the of the role. 
On the other hand, we have intelligence that tells us what are the activities uh, performed, what are the actions performed uh, using this role. So we can compare the two and deduce uh, when there are permissions that are excessive, right? Um, so here we can see that uh, this is the case. We found that this role is overprivileged. It has permissions that, it, it, that it, it's not using. The severity is critical. The severity is dynamic. It depends on the redundant permissions, those excessive permissions. Uh, so what we look at here is we, we have this list of permissions that are excessive with the original permission and what we suggest to do with it. Um, we calculate this, the IM sensitivity of those permissions. Um, so again, connecting back to what we saw before, that this IM sensitivity score. And depending on this sensitivity, we're going to be able to, uh, to give a severity to the, to the finding. Um, so if, for example, you grant excessive permissions, but really their sensitivity is low, it doesn't have such, such an impact on your cloud environment, then the finding will most likely be in low severity. Here, uh, the critical severity indicates that the excessive permissions are sensitive. Uh, we can see here how uh, to remediate the, the, the role. So you can either take this policy and create a new policy for the role. So this is if you choose the consolidated policy, or you can go uh, for each policy and see how it should be corrected independently. So now if we, oh, sorry, one, one last thing that I wanted to explain. Uh, we can see here the analysis period. The analysis period is the time for which we, we looked at the logs, at the activity logs. Um, we're going to add very soon the number of days because uh, doing the math here can be a bit uh, challenging. Uh, but basically, it helps you understand. For example, let's say that uh, we, we looked at uh, 45 days and you have a company policy that is uh, uh, 60 days. So, so you would be able to see this uh, from here. Um, so if I open this role, just to, to go back to my, um, to my permission map, to my entitlement map. So I can see all those policies, right? Um, I can see that each policy in here, in this example, everything is over permissive, but those policies are only in medium severity um, because the, extra per, the excessive permissions they're granting are less sensitive. Those are actually critical. And you can see that within each policy, I can see the original, I can see, sorry, the suggestion. I can see how to remediate it. So if you were auditing, you're not looking at the finding, whatever uh, way you get to this map, uh, in case there is uh, a problem of uh, over permission, you will see it from the map as well. Um, if there is no problem, you'll see the status valid that we saw in the beginning. Um, so that's pretty much it. Oh, here we can see I was mentioning specific resources. So here, for example, this policy gives access to compute and here to specific resource for the action create tags. Um, so that's it for Kim. Uh, now we can move on to questions, uh, Shai. Yeah, sure. So uh, many questions from Andre. Uh, could uh, Kim identi identify unused uh, roles? Roles that yes. they are not used for uh, the last uh, several days, for example. Yes, so we saw it uh, actually in the in the dashboard. Okay. We have it here. Uh, uh, do you have plans for multi-cloud support for the ERM? For the ERM, for the ERM, we already have uh, multi-cloud support. Um, I didn't show you the entities per type, but we already support those assets. So there is uh, already multi-cloud support. Uh, we don't have the same level of support for each uh, asset type, but uh, it's definitely uh, something we're doing from the start, supporting uh, multi-clouds. Okay. Uh, are there uh, any auto-remediation actions that can be configured? So right now on the misconfigurations, you can use the cloud boats that are already available. Um, so this is already provided. I believe that for the, the vulnerabilities, uh, we don't have right now uh, automated remediation. Um, but this is a very important topic for us. So we're working with our customers, uh, our EA partners, et cetera, to determine exactly how how they want the remediation to happen. And uh, we have a lot of, uh, of plans around this. OK. Uh, does uh, all uh, CloudGuard assets uh, type have a risk code and included in the scope of the ERM? 
no, you have the answer on the screen. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, also there we're uh, growing the, the coverage, uh, obviously, but we started with uh, what we felt was the most uh, important. Can you tell uh, how long does it take to update the Kim data in the portal once the new AWS permission policy is installed? Um, I think I am not 100% sure. I think it's up to an hour. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I think it's about that. that uh, and that order. And are there any limitation of uh, this uh, new feature related to the retention, re retention of uh, data? Uh, no, because we look at um, up to uh, 90 days of information. And ah, wait, 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 wait. Retention of data. You mean for intelligence? That's the. Uh, uh, I'm not sure we didn't uh, wrote. Uh... Yeah, I, I see. So yes, so 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 if we have logs for uh, the past three months, then 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 we'll be able to go up to ninety days of uh, of uh, information. Um, and uh, if it's up to to one month, then then yes, we'll have only logs for one month. So so it, yes, it is connected to the the retention. I guess if the question is about intelligence. Uh, another question: uh, Does for the Kim uh, are queries elements included in the GSL? Not yet, um, but uh, being able to query uh, entitlement is also one of the the major feature we want feature. Sorry, we want to to support in Kim. So part of the our roadmap right now. But I didn't see if uh, you mentioned it or not. But uh, Kim uh, supported the uh, Kubernetes. Uh, the not K8. yet. Not yet. Not yet. Uh, not yet. These are the asset types that are supported in Kim. By the way, something I forgot to say when I was presenting in the beginning, but Kim and ERM are, are, I said it for AWP, but not for the rest. They're also part of the CSPM offering, right? It's not, there's nothing to add. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, already part of the, of the offering. Yes, what I didn't say, by the way, is about the Lambda functions. Mm -hmm. um, if we go back to the, the overview, we had some, uh, overprivileged Lambda functions. Um, so I don't want to explain now the our serverless uh, feature in, uh, in, uh, in, in CloudGuard, but um, overprivileged Lambda functions is not done um, in the same way that we, we spot overprivileged uh, IAM roles. Um, this comes from our serverless feature. We're able to do this uh, by analyzing the, the code of the Lambda. We don't actually need to look at the the activity performed by the Lambda function, but this looks the same, right? So, so this is something that was uh, already available for our serverless feature. And okay, uh, what reporting capabilities are available for the risk data? Um, so right now, um, besides uh, exporting the dashboard that should be available uh, soon, and the protected assets, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, but um, but we're working on this. It's a request that has come uh, several times. Uh, so this is part also of the, the highly prioritized features for uh, for year. I see. Uh, does uh, the team integrated the somehow with the ISC scanning, detect, prevent configuration? Uh, not today. Uh, we need to understand better the use cases there because uh, in Kim we look at uh, activities, so it's uh, not just a matter of configuration. Okay, thank you, Abby. I think uh, we uh, you answer the uh, most of the questions, and uh, sure. we'll take all of them and uh, we will paste it uh, with the answers on the on the community on the the post. So, uh, uh, Abby, thank you very much. Uh, Benny, sure. also thank you, and uh, thank you all for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.